think it, yes, I'm sorry. I had not turned it on. I had turned it off and then I forgot. Sorry, thank you. I feel responsible every time they come here. Um, no, they, I don't know, I don't think they are nearby, so we have to walk. Okay, um, now with this pyramid that is small, uh, this is our class. This, as a matter of fact, is 130A. Not everything in there, but the fundamentals. And then from there you can go to circuits, you can then talk about circuits, you can talk about antennas, you can talk eventually about systems. Now, I would like to show you some applications. Um, let's take the iPhone. Has, how many of you have seen what is inside an iPhone? Okay, very good. Um, do you, uh, for those, as well, um, I'm not gonna ask then, so usually inside an iPhone, it might not be visible, but there are multiple layers, as you can see there. There are multiple layers for different reasons, because you have to go vertically, otherwise your iPhone will be this big. So you stack it vertically and you make it smaller. And then every time you create a vertical architecture, then every circuit you are going to design has to be packaged. The only thing, packaged meaning shielded. You remember we learned about shielding? Because if you don't have a shield, all of the charges that will go to all different places are going to create fields and those will interact. And then nothing is gonna work. So every individual circuit that has been designed, it's shielded and it's called a chip. And then you place it in there, you will see later. Antennas are the only ones which are not shielded, obviously because they are the ones who are which are meant to radiate. So, um, here, this one has an antenna. And if you look at the two white arrows, I don't know how easy it is to see them from there, but the antenna, if you have this, it's not showing here, but if you have this kind of uh, phone, or it could be not a, an iPhone, it could be another one, this antenna is just around the top side, including the two corners. It's a plastic that allows the antenna to radiate. And um, then you go to another one, you may have seen phones that have this split of the two metallic plates. Where that split there, it's called a slot antenna. It radiates. Why does this antenna radiate? It's because of something we've learned. Because there are two conducting plates, like this. And they have been left without any grounding. So one plane will bring, since there are a lot of charges, that are generated in there, and then, of course, the plates are connected with the source. This one here is gonna generate that one there. So what kind of electric field I'm going to have? An electric field like that, if it is meant to radiate, is called a slot antenna. So it's designed to do that. So that is one thing, it's in integrated in the package of the phone. It's a smart design, obviously, because you don't want that. The old cell phones, when, before you were born, they had, uh, seriously in the 80s, for example, they were huge, they had a dipole, pretty big sticking out, because those, this technology had not been developed yet. So if you open an iPhone, that's how it looks. So there are a lot of things in there. If you go really close, you're gonna see that there will be chips, like these squares. Um, this is a chip, for example. This is another one, bigger one. There are different ones here. Each one of them packaged. And the only thing that is around them are connections, interconnects, and a lot of big capacitors to stop any charges from the ground, whatever ground you have in the package, to go up into the chip. 
So you will see a lot of them, like all of these here. All of these are capacitors that they have been placed. Now, let's take this one, which one did I, there is one of them, I will show it to you next, which is um, that part, this red one, and that's the barcode reader module. We call it a module because it has one specific function, it's not just one simple circuit, there are more than one. And as you can see, it's all packets. There is nothing exposed. Now, if I go into this and look at what is inside these packets, practically you are going to find a tiny chip at the center connected to various pins, as we call them. And these pins will connect to different to voltages, to different interconnects where the current has to go someplace else to different sources and so forth. So you design that separately and then w you do it with a robot. You put it, you, you, you cannot do it by, by hand. It's very, very difficult, they are very small. So you place them accurately at places where there are holes and you will see those holes in the next one. Look at this. This is another similar package. I see it's developed integrated circuit, it means it has been developed for digital processing. Look at the holes in there. The, the holes, we are calling them via holes, via. It means you go from one through the layer, so via the layer. So there are via holes because practically they allow you to put the pin in there and to put it in a firm way so there is good connection between the metals. And then look at all of these other lines we call interconnects. These are not transmission lines. They are simple interconnects. And you will see, we will see the difference when we come there. Uh, everything there is digital, so there is no high frequency. But all of these lines bring bits and other things, other information to the chip, and then there is processing. If you go, however, to high frequencies, the chips look different. They look, they look smaller. Um, the yellow you see over here is gold. The holes are practically, this is half of the package. The chip is at this one, is at the center. These are three ports, one input, two output, one IF practically. Um, and the holes here is to align the upper and the lower package and then um, shield them, I mean, put them together in a, sh in, in a uh, attach them, so there is good contact. And then practically you have your chip there in, in a package. Now, if you see here, as you will see later, there you have much less complexity in your circuit because at high frequencies. You cannot put the lines, too many lines too close together. This, for example, is a microstrip interconnect. All of these are microstrip lines. This is a filter. Um, this is a, what we call a balloon. It's a, it's a um, matching network. We'll do some matching networks. Um, this is another matching network. You see sections of lines that are separately placed, um, and they are far enough compared to the other ones you saw for the digital if you go back one. Look at these ones. Everything here, and this is even smaller than the previous circuit by maybe a thousand times. So when you go to high frequencies, you have to know about electromagnetic waves because you have electric and magnetic fields, all right? And that's why we need to understand the relationship between electric and magnetic fields. So then, um, this is a transfer transceiver module. That's how small it may look. Uh, if you look at it under the microscope, then you can see all of the details, but in reality now, as we go to thinner and thinner substrates, we can go to smaller and smaller circuits, and then you can have here a lot of circuits in a very small, in a very small um, device. This is another circuit layout. Now, what you're going to see here is some shapes that you recognize. This rectangular is a loop. Because when you we will see that when we have more than one loops together, 
when you have one loop, it gives you an induc inductance. We will define it. When you have more than one loops together, it gives you higher inductance. So all of these squares that you see here, one, two, three, four, the fewer loops, the, f the lower the inductance. All of these are placed here. So these are capacitors, one, two, three, down here, the yellow. And um, practically the whole circuit here is a combination of inductors and capacitors with some active devices, obviously. But that's how this is a layout. It has not been made yet. You do it electronically. You do it using appropriate software like AutoCAD, it's a like that. And then you develop the circuit. Um, this is another digital. Now you can see the the complexity as it goes to more and more. This is a manufactured, obviously. This is for lower frequencies because the lines are so close. Otherwise, if I had that at 5G, it will never work. But um, you go down and then that's another high frequency. It's an RF front end, we call it. It's a place where you receive the signal, you uh, down convert it, you get the information, or you transmit also, and then you up convert and then you send it out from the antenna. The antenna is not here, but look at this spiral inductor. This is one. It does not end here. There is a via hole that takes it down. So the, the current does not terminate in an inductor. Okay, it goes and then it moves away. And then there is another one. You can see all of these multiple inductors and capacitors, these square things. This one and this one are capacitors. Now, we go to another application, which is a smart car. A smart car today has a number of sensors, many sensors. Most of them, however, which are related to collision avoidance, are placed in the front and the back, or in front, front and both sides, and then the sides on the back and the whole back area. And um, these sensors are relatively small. So this one, for example, this shows the size. It's 4.5 millimeters by 5.5 millimeters, a small radar. It could be any one of the side ones, practically. And it looks like this with an antenna on. You can see the antenna has four patches. So it's the, the small radar, which is this one, connected to the antenna, which is down here. And then you go further and you have farming drones, the ones that you see sometimes you drive on, have you seen those drones that are um, watering sometimes or they, 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 I don't know what they spray, different things on the plant, hopefully not very dangerous chemicals, but uh, a lot of times if you drive to the airport, you will see the planes which are unmanned, they're drones. Um, they don't have a person usually to guide them, but they have a system. So if you know the, if you have devices to get the GPS position that you have, then you can put it as a program. And then those will go, will, will dive down. You will see that. I mean, it's, it's amazing if you go sometimes in the morning and drive there. All of this is full of instruments. There are no people in there. Oh, some of the circuits look like that, very similar to what we saw before. So inductors here. Um, these are transmission lines. This is, in fact, it divides from the antennas down, all right, or goes up, and it divides to multiple feeds for the antennas. But you can see all of these, and these are other inductors here, inductors there, but you can see all of the transmission lines. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting design. I mean, you can practically identify things that we are learning in this class. Now, with that, I wanted to, you will find it on Canvas, but I wanted to tell you that um, the reason we are going through um, a lot of the material in this class is because um, we are trying to build up what we know so at the end, you have all of the components to be able to start understanding circuits. We are going to talk in transmission lines about matching networks. We are going to talk about some filters using RC circuits and filters using LC circuits. And then you're going to start getting into more interesting applications. So I wanted, I meant to show you this in the beginning of the class, but then I thought 
it would be better if we do this a little later. So when um, you have already covered some material to be able to appreciate. Any comments or questions about that? In your, um, in um, the notes I have for a summary from previous lectures, what I have tried to do is to summarize at least the formulas that you need to remember that we have covered and then try to compare the electrostatic formulas with magnetostatic because there is so much duality between the fields. And that's what allows us to have a very concise set of equations for electromagnetic. Otherwise, if that duality was not there, it would have been very difficult to have, um, to be able to put Maxwell's equations into this form. I was reading um, many years back the treatise, treatise of electromagnetics by Maxwell. And there is not one single equation in there. Because in mathematics, we did not have the formulations for integrals or derivatives. And there was no, the divergence concept <laughs> had not been developed. The gradient vector had not been developed. So everything is in words. If you can imagine where we went, so it was all observation. It was all, you know, stories about how, not necessarily, you know, it was accurate stories uh, from observations he had made in the lab. And the only reason he was able to develop the Maxwell's, the Maxwell's equations, which we are using for EM fields, is because there was duality. He noticed that there were similarities between electric and magnetic fields, it's electrostatic and magnetostatic, obviously. So that duality is extremely important. And then I wanted to write the equations here. So um, you, you keep them in mind, and you will have, you have those um, canvas. So in electrostatic, so we have free space. Then we have dielectrics there. Okay. In free space, what we found is that if you have two charges, Q1 and Q2, then they feel a force. Each one of them does. And then we explain that as saying that if Q is one charge that generates an electric field, and let's assume Q1 was that charge that generated the electric field, then if you bring a charge Q2, then it feels this force. But it could be the reverse too, all right? Q2 could generate the electric field, and Q1 would feel the force. So we have we found that the electric force it was 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, Q1, Q2 over R magnitude cubed vector R, where vector R is the vector that connects the two charges from Q1 to Q2. And then epsilon naught, we called this, we called it the um, electric permittivity of free space was 8.8542, if you're going to go that far, 10 to minus 12 farads per meter. And we said that it, it is, it does have the units of a capacitance per unit length. So we keep that in mind. Also, from here, we then defined the electric field as the ratio of the electric force that is generated by a charge Q divided by this charge. And, um, and in fact, is 
in fact, I would say if it's generated by Q1, then you will have to divide by Q2, all right? So uh, where I will write it here so you, you can go from here to there. But in general, we found the formula that said that E is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught Q then 1, it was a generating charge, where now the vector R, this vector connects the generating charge to whatever point in space you are measuring this electric field, and it's electric field intensity vector, if you want to be accurate when you say that. And then we introduced D, which is as epsilon naught E as the electric flux density. In fact, I will not use that since we have seen this. So we introduced that. And then from there, we talked about Gauss's law. So Gauss's law. which says that divergence of D is nothing else but the volume charge density at that point. And then we went from the differential form of Gauss's law to the integral form of Gauss's law, which is that um, the closed surface integral of D dot ds is the total charge Q within the volume that is surrounded by this closed surface X. Okay, so these were the important formulas here. Then we went to dielectric. And in dielectrics, we introduced a new vector. So we said dielectrics are materials that do not have free electrons, but they have electrons which are bound to the nucleus. And so when there is an electric field in the dielectric, these electrons move, they stay connected they stay in the atom. They don't leave the atom. They stay there, but they somehow move away from the nucleus. So the nucleus looks like a dipole. And in fact, we, ca we call la that the polarization dipole. So only exists when there is an elect electric field applied to it. And then it goes away, this phenomenon, when the electric field goes to zero. And then we define the polarization vector as epsilon from this relationship plus P. We said that all of these polarization dipoles that are aligned under the influence of an electric field create a different field, the polarization field which opposes, you remember the uh, uh, applied field, and creates a vector, the polarization vector, which now shows that the new electric flux density is this component plus an additional term. And they're all vectors. And we said that P is nothing else, of course, only exists when E exists, does not exist by itself, and is equal to A for our class, for this material, for these types of dielectrics, to a scalar times E, where we call that the sustainability, all right, of. Um, electric sustainability of the material. And then we characterize this D, we rewrote it as epsilon E 
where epsilon now is epsilon sub r, epsilon naught, and we call that the relative dielectric constant. Okay. From then this, especially now we have dielectrics. Of course, it was true for free space, but now that we have dielectrics, we introduced the concept of a capacitor, which is nothing else but an electric variable that characterizes the ability of two conductors with a dielectric in between to withstand charge. And so it's Q over V. And that is called a capacitor, capacitance as an entity and the structures that have these are called capacitors. All right, capacitor is the structure, capacitance is this parameter. Okay, also then we went to conducting material, still in electrostatics, and conducting to conducting material. And there, we introduced a new parameter for the material, which is called conductivity. And that tells us the following. It tells us that there are these materials, which are not only the materials that have an epsilon, which means they have this bound electron, so they create polarization dipole, but they also have free electrons. It's a combination of free and bound. And the free electrons, under the uh, influence of the electric field, create a current. They flow. They start moving. When an electron moves, creates a current. And we said a positive direction for the current is opposite to the direction of the electron. All right? So that's by convention. And this current, J, is connected, of course, to the applied electric field because it does not exist when the electric field goes to zero. It is connected to it through this conduct uh, um, conductivity. And from there, from these materials, we found a resistor. We defined the resistor as the ratio V over I. The voltage, if you have a material, bulk material, that is between two metallic plates, and then the voltage across those plates is V. Then, if you find the total current that flows because of conductivity, then you have a new parameter that is called resistivity. And the structure that has that is called the resistor. OK. Now, we moved from there to all of this electrostatics. Then we moved here to magnetostatics. OK, now we found the same now as we did here. We found that a, um, if we have, instead of an electric field, a static magnetic field, B. So it's a B is a magnetic flux density, but of course it represents not just the flux density, but the field too, all right? So we have a magnetic field B and um, constant static. And in that one, we have a charge that is moving with a velocity V. Then this charge feels a force, which is a magnetic force. Since we know that a moving charge is nothing else but a current, then practically, we can rewrite this. We can rewrite this expression in the f in the form of a current and a B. But instead of that, we are using this expression for B, and we say now we can define from this force a B entity, which is given a magnetic flux entity, which is given from here. And is a differential form 
without a current then of bio savart law, practically, but in, in this differential form. It's not, there is no derivative here, but it's in a point in, at a point in space. There is no integral form. Now, where B has been uh, defined as, or where the magnetic field defines in terms of B as a, the, from this relationship, where mu sub naught is a new parameter, we call it magnetic permeability, and mu naught is 4 pi 10 to minus 7 Henry per meter, which shows us this is nothing else but inductance per unit length. And then we can rewrite B in an integral form, and that is called the non Biot-Savart form. And instead of QV, we have a current, I dL cross R. And that is over the length of this total current that creates. So there is a current there, I, that creates a magnetic field, B. And if the current, of course, is not like a point current, there is no such a thing, all right? There are currents that flow along lines. But if you have a current that has a length, L, then that is going to create a field, B, that you have to find it by integrating along the length of the current. And then we have, so this is Biot Savart. And then we have another important law, which is Ampere's law, that says that at the point in space, there is this relationship, or in terms of the magnetic field intensity, is this, and that's Ampere's law. Okay. These are the fundamental equations we have developed. There is a lot of symmetry in those. So I want you to remember this, and I want you to remember the symmetry that you see and then, of course, the only difference is that here, divergence of B is zero. All right? Divergence of B is zero, which means that if I take the um, line, the surface integral of B over a closed surface, this is going to be zero, which means the flux, the magnetic flux, is it over an enclosed, the total, the total magnetic flux over an enclosed surface is zero. That's the characteristic as opposed, of course, to this one. Okay. Any questions? Yes. That is, um, this is current. So yes, it's a, so if you have a charge moving, so if you have current, then you do, that does create a magnetic field. Yes, they say it's the vector who connects that point, all right, at some point, of course, this is at the point, the space where the charge is here and you, your observation point is the, there, and then that's what you see. But if you want to find the total field, B, not just you know, what you see at that point because of that specific charge there, then you have to integrate. OK. Let us now, um, let me ask you, did I solve um, last time the um, which problems did I solve last time? Uh, magnetic field from currents. Did I do a single um, loop or not at all? OK, let me see. I want to make sure that I have not left anything.
I did the um, field view to an infinite wire. Yes, okay, perfect. So we did that. Any questions so far? Because now we are ready to go to ma mag static magnetic field, but inside magnetic material. Inside materials that don't have um, new knot, but they have something additional. So we are making, in magnetostatics, we are making a transition from similar to the one we made from free space to dielectrics. Here we are making a transition from free space to magnetics. Any questions before we start with that? Okay. We'll make an introduction and then we can have a five minute break before we continue. So let's see. Just a second. Um, there are different types of magnetic materials. So we call magnetic material all the materials that have a magnetic permeability that is higher than new knot. So they have a new, which is higher than new knot. Now, in the most general case, as you will see much later if you continue in this area, this mu is not just only scalar and is not a constant. All right, when it's scalar and it's constant, then these are, first of all, if it's constant and not dependent on time t, then this material is called a, a linear uh, material. But if then you start having a mu that changes over time or a mu that changes in, um, in the space, which is called an anisotropic material, then things become more complex. So for now, we have linear, uniform, isotropic, magnetic materials. Okay, there are different types of magnetic materials. They are the diam, diam diamagnetic paramagnetic ferromagnetic And in this ferromagnetic family, you have perimagnetic, and um, what's the other one? There are some other ones that are called anti ferrimagnetic and so forth. I mean, there is a whole list on the basis of the crystal orientation and the properties. And there are many others also from here. All of these under that. So there are three primary families of magnetic materials. Diamagnetic, paramagnetic, ferromagnetic. The characteristic of these two is that they only um, get a 
create something similar to an electric polarization, so they create a magnetization. So they create a, a magnetization vector like we have the polarization vector, and we'll explain that, only if there is an electric field that applies to that. When the electric field goes to zero, everything goes to zero. From those, the magnetization vector goes to zero. So it only when the magnetic field is there, and when it goes away, it's like the, the, the material is like, behaves as it would behave without any before. Ferromagnetic materials, however, have memory. And all of these have memory. So when you start applying a magnetic field, and then you turn it off, the material still maintains its magnetization vector. And then how long it maintains and what happens and how it changes depends on the crystal uh, orientation and the form of the crystal in this material. All right? So in the book, which we're not going to do, it has a hysteresis properties of ferromagnetic materials. We're not going to do them because there is no need to spend time to understand that. But it does its impact how the material behaves when you apply the magnetic field and then when you turn it off. And so um, obviously you know about hysteresis, all right? You have seen it. In may in maybe you have heard about this before. Have you heard about hysteresis before? Yes? But we're not going to cover it in this class, so we can really move on. All right, so the materials we are going to consider are these two today. And those materials have, of course, an new. And what are these materials, in other words? They are materials like the dielectrics that have bound electrons. But what is interesting with these electrons in these particular materials is not like when you have a, an atom and then you have the nucleus here and then you have the e electron or more, then we said in dielectric materials, they don't leave the atom, but they are displaced. So the center of the negative charge is displaced compared to where the positive charge is centered. And that's why you have the dipole. All right, here, for example, since it goes around, the center is the same. So here is dielectric. In magnetic material, uh, you have something like that, of course, but you have electrons that do one of two things when you apply an electric field. Um, they don't displace themselves, but the electron starts <coughs> spinning around the center. So instead of moving its negative, charge, so instead of the electrons displacing themselves a little further away from the nucleus, from what they were before, but without leaving the atom, here they start spinning around. They still remain around the, uh, at the same distance from the atom, but they spin. And when they spin, they create electric current. So if the electron spins like that, then it creates an equivalent electric current like this, a little loop. Now, here what happens in this material, um, when, now you may say that some materials may have this already happening, but, so they, you may still have for whatever reasons the electron spinning, but because they are oriented in all of these different directions, there is not electric field to align them, all of these currents, there will be some like this, some like this, and so forth, all right? And then at the end, these are microscopic now, uh, characterizations. At the end, when you look at the whole thing, there is nothing. It's all coming to be zero. That's what happens here. In the ferromagnetic, however, the moment that the spin of the electron, of the electrons is oriented, so there are more than those, so you have another one here. And then also behaves the same way with the same direction. So that creates a similar current. So in the material, you have all of these currents 
all align. So they create a magnetic field, little magnetic fields that come together to be <coughs> observable microscopically. And that is called the magnetization vector, M. And the magnetization vector is in reality nothing else but the sum of all of these um, mo magnetic moments, all right, we call them, to whatever infinite many there are in the material. And of course, one over mu naught, if this is similar to magnetic flux density. So what we find for this material is that the B, if you have therefore a magnetic field, so we take this away. Now we have a material like that, this material, and then a magnetic field applies to it like this. This, so magnetic field intensity is the same like that, obviously. But you find out that this B now in this material is equal to H, what H would have been in free space, plus this M. So in other words, what happens here is the following. The, um, the little currents create then what they do is that they reduce as they did in dielectrics, the intensity of the magnetic field, all right? Because practically what you see from here is H, as we found in dielectric materials, is gonna be B over mu naught minus M. Now, we're not gonna exactly look at this, we're not gonna use it beyond that. The only thing we are using it for is to say that this can be rewritten as M mu H. Because obviously M depends on H. M only exists when H exists. And from here, this mu, we, do, we characterize it, we rewrite it as a mu sub bar, mu sub naught. So this is um, the reason I went into these details to see that there is something similar that happens in these types of magnetic materials, not this, these types of magnetic materials, similar to what happens in the dielectrics. The only difference is in the dielectrics we have dipoles, and here we have current loops. All right, now from this point on, therefore, we have some, um, interesting things to keep in mind. I mean, practically we can take the equations, replace mu naught with mu, and solve similar problems, all right? There is, however, a difference in this material compared to the dielectrics. In the dielectrics, you can find materials where epsilon sub r is not a thousand times bigger than epsilon naught, I mean, than one. So epsilon is not a thousand times bigger than epsilon naught. But in magnetic materials, you may have mu sub bar values that are extremely high. And that, if you have a magnetic material in free space, and then, uh, or you, when you introduce a magnetic material like this in a, mag in a magnetic field, then it really changes the distribution of the magnetic field. So, um, when you want to confine the magnetic field, you use magnetic materials. And that's what we are doing in the coils, all right? So in the solenoids, in the um, toroids, uh, whenever we have loops of current and we don't want the magnetic field to flow around, we place a magnetic material in there and then attract all of the magnetic field inside the magnetic material. That's the 
the difference between what we've seen in dielectrics and what we see in magnetics, all right? And in magnetics that we are using, obviously. Okay, so now what I would like to do is um, to go back to the things we knew so which will allow us to solve some interesting problems. Okay, uh, before we do that, I would like to add something more to our discussion. When you have a um, magnetic a magnetic field and you place in there, so you have a magnetic field and you place in there a um, magnetic material like that, so you have mu here, what is going to happen is that the, um, electric currents will all align like this, and then they will create this additional field, okay, here, inside. Because, however, there is going to be a lot of them on the surface of the dielectric, right here, on the magnetic, when you look from the outside in, it's like you see a surface current here. All right, because um, they're going to be, if you look at the surface only and you are somewhere here, so you still have that. You have not lost your magnetic field in this case, at least the direction. But it's like you're going to see here a, um, all of this current flowing. And that implies that Somewhere here, there is going to be a um, discontinuity of the magnetic field because of this current. So this is very similar to what we have seen for conductors. All right. So um, if you have a, so I said that about the magnetic fields, but the same thing applies to conductors. Now. I also wanted to tell you the following, that if this M is much larger than mu naught, then, um, and if the magnetic field does not go like that, but it goes parallel to the dielectric, so to the magnetic, so it's like this, and then the magnetic field goes like that, then the magnetic field here, which is going to be B equals mu H with mu much higher than mu naught, all right, is going to be much higher than the field here, which is going to be mu naught H. And uh, let's assume here H1, B1, B2, H2. So um, if this is true, then practically it's like you see a zero practical here compared to this one, and all of the magnetic field connected there, all right? That are some of the things we need to keep in mind, which are different from what they have, we have seen in dielectrics. Now, We'll stop here for a moment, and then what I would like to do is to go back 
into electric and um, ele uh, uh, conductors. And before I start talking about what is happening to uh, the boundary conditions when we have materials like this in free space or two materials like that, I would like to speak about the boundary conditions um, on the surface of a conductor when you have a magnetic field, all right? Because we need to cover that and then move to um, the uh, interfaces and then from there solve different problems, all right? So is it clear what I'm trying to do? So I introduced the concept of the magnetic. We talked about what happens inside the magnetic fields. We are gonna stop thinking about this for a moment and then we'll only think about a mu. And then we said that when the magnetic field orients in different directions, you may have, in fact, a serious redistribution of the magnetic field because of the material. Now, we'll stop there, go to conductors, and then we'll come back to this. Any questions so far? Let's take a few moments, let's take five minute break, and then come back. I was wanted to clarify what H was in this case. Is that like the old magnetic field? It's a magnetic field, field intensity. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then U has to do with mu. The material. Mu. Mu. Yes, is the, is the material. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. In the, in, you know, we, we always, in free space, it was B equals mu not H. Now it's mu H. Okay. And that mu incorporates all of the phenomena. Oh, there were, did they pick them up on? Uh, okay. Um, yeah, one, uh, do we have them here? Yeah, and the, uh, they can come and pick it, or the, do you distribute them? Okay. At the end of the class, uh, you can pick up your quizzes if you want. All right, at the, uh, at the back. Um, we're going to leave a few minutes earlier so you have time to pick up your quizzes. Okay, so let's do Okay, let's start to talk about um what happens when a magnetic field is 
um, generated and then inside that magnetic field, it's still a static magnetic field, we bring a perfect conductor. All right, so perfect conductor is here. Uh, what do we know about perfect conductors? That have an infinite supply of electrons, practically, free electrons. A perfect conductor has an infinite supply of um, free electrons. Okay, so what happens to these free electrons when there is a magnetic field? To understand that, we need to think of what happens to one charge when that charge is moving, because these electrons are moving, all right? So when you have an electron inside a magnetic field, what happens to it? Let's assume that we have a magnetic field. So here we make a parenthesis, practically. We have a magnetic field like that. It goes into the board. Uniform. And then let's, uh, instead of an electron, we can take a positive charge. You can take a negative charge too, but let's take a charge to see what happens to any charge, positive or negative, when it comes into this. Let's assume that you take a positive charge that can be a hole, all right? The holes are running as fast as electrons because the electrons create them when they leave. The electron leaves fast, the hole goes the other way with the same speed. Okay, let's assume that we have this now uh, positive charge, meaning the absence of an electron, and is coming into this with a velocity v. Have you solved this problem before? We're not going to solve it here, but I will tell you what is happening, all right? So we'll, we're not going to solve the full problem. If you have this charge Q with a velocity V in the magnetic field B, then we know that it's going to feel a force. That we know. And the force F sub M on this charge will be QV cross B. In this case, if this is X, y, and this is z, then v is along the x direction, b is along the negative z direction, and then f sub m which is the force on this charge, is going to be QVB. And then you have A sub X cross minus A sub Z. And how much is that? A sub Y is the positive Y direction. So it's going to be QVB A sub Y. So um, if A sub Y is here, immediately, as, so, as soon as it is coming into this field, it's going to feel this force F sub M. What happens when you have a vertical force that pulls this charge in that direction while the charge goes with the velocity V? The charge is going to start moving like this. But then whatever direction it takes, the force is going to always be perpendicular to it. So it's going to force the charge to go around in a loop. Do you remember that? You should have seen this in the past. And the, the radius of this loop depends, of course, on uh, the value of the B field, the mass of the particle, and so forth. What that means, coming back here, is that all of these free electrons that go everywhere, they will start running around in loops in the presence of a magnetic field. All right, let's assume that the magnetic field will be like this, B. So what is going to happen if B is like this, 
And then, let's assume that the electron was going like that. V. Then the force, if this is x, y, and v, the force on this electron will be F sub m minus Q V V is along the Z direction cross um, B which is along the Y direction the uh, excuse me X direction and this is going to be along the Y direction and if this the and um, let me see, x, v, so, excuse me, b, ah, yes. So practically, this is going to be b, close, uh, b cross um, v, and, and this is, called, therefore, are uh, going to make loops like this, all right, close to the surface. Yes. Q, V, B. Sorry. Q, V, B. I, I put one, erase the other. Q, V, B. And then it's A sub Y. So we, what is going to happen as they move like this, you are going to then, and then the conductor, for example, is like that. You are going to see a positive, a current flowing um, because you cannot, you cannot eventually, you know, the, 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 this V, this uh, charge is not going to flow out of the conductor. So what is going to happen is going to, to go on loops like this. And eventually, you're going to see on this surface uh, inside the conductor a current here. All right. So... What happens, therefore, when there is a magnetic field that applies on a perfect conductor, then the, there is going to be a current that flows in the same direction. And the direction, of course, is going to depend on the direction of the magnetic field. Okay, So there is going to be a current on the surface of the conductor. Now, what is going to happen here? This goes down like this. This goes up like that. Down here up, down here, up. So in between, all of this will cancel out here. And then because there are going to be other ones here, they will cancel out everywhere. And they're going to see it only here and on the other side if there is another side of the conductor, all right, unless it's grounded. So it's very similar to what we saw with charge, charges, but these are with currents, moving charges. So when you have, therefore, out of this, a, um, let me do this here, a perfect conductor and then a magnetic field. Then we have a surface current density, J sub F, and it's a vector. And it's only in the surface because that's where it's not canceled out. All right, here it's going to be canceled out because of this multiple ring. And so forth. And they will all go the same direction. All right? So they all cancel out. That's what happens. But with the exception of here. All right. Now, because of that, therefore, we can write our boundary conditions on a, yes. Oh, why was negative here? Because that is an, an electron minus Q. I mean, it could be a positive. Uh, I don't know. All right. So um, even if I have to say the, the, the J, J, the current, is going to have an opposite direction of the flow of the electron because that's what we have. All right. The, this is the direction for, therefore, J, which is because of this, is going to have the, if the electrons, if an electron moves like this, 
J moves like that. All right, we have done this by convention. But I put it here just because I was talking about elections. All right. Um, so now let's go to this F conductor interface and then see what happens when you have a magnetic field on it. Then the boundary conditions for this case will be the following. And they can be proven to be like this. And I have this proof in my notes, if you are interested, usually what um, you do to find this out is, I will explain what you do. I will write the conditions, I will explain how you find them, but all of the derivations are in my notes, all right? So, if N, if this is a conductor, perfect conductor. If N is the vector of the surface, all right, towards the outside, then one of the boundary, and this is H1, then one of the boundary conditions for this conductor is that this is equal to J sub F. All right? And the other boundary condition is B normal now, because this is tangential, as you can imagine, this because of N and the cross product. B normal, one, then is zero on a perfect conductor. And why is that? Because um, there otherwise there would be continuity of B, normal, but because E in a perfect conductor, both E and H are zero, all right? So that these are the two boundary conditions on the surface of a perfect conductor. Now, let us go to a material so this perfect conductor. Let's go now to another material where um, you don't have a perfect conductor, but you have a magnetic material. All right, so now we write it here. Magnetic material, you have the same magnetic field, H1. Of course, there is gonna be here H2. And in magnetic materials, depending on the type of the magnetic material, um, you may have, because of all of these um, both bound spins, and if it has also free electrons, the currents that those free electrons will generate, you may have in the magnetic both a magnetization vector, meaning a current here due to the magnetic field, which is part of the mu, all right? You may have, you, because of this mu, you're gonna have all of these little currents here because of the magnetization vector, but because of the free electrons, like in the conductor, you will also have a surface current. All right, you may have a magnetic that has both things. Um, there's the bound spins and the free electrons that start running on this circle, all right, like uh, on a, a circula circular path. So the circular path from the free electrons will only give the surface current because the other ones will cancel out, but the uh, polarization spin, the polarization, the magnetization spin from here, they will remain and they will be throughout the volume. In this particular case, the boundary conditions change and they will be N cross H1 minus H2 will be this surface current J sub F, which is due to the free electrons that start moving like that and may or may not be there. If the material, if the, if the magnetic material does not have those free electrons, then this is gonna be zero. And in this particular case, this is gonna be zero. Okay, but so it depends a lot on the material and that is gonna be given to us. 
And then second, we have that L dot B1 minus B2 will be zero. These are the boundary conditions then for an interface. Now, it could be here, mu1 and mu2. It could be two magnetic material, all right? And it could be also not only a current that is generated because of the magnetic field, but it could be a current of, from a source. I may have an antenna here. I may have a conductor, a very thin. I may have an, a, a just a current that flows in, that I have imposed, you know, to flow there in between. All of these currents will come here. The surface currents will all be here, all of them. And the volume currents will be incorporated in here and here. They're not going to show explicitly. Is that, um, is that clear? So these are the boundary conditions for um, a free space perfect conductor when you have a magnetic field and the boundary conditions between two magnetic materials in the presence of a magnetic field but also with a presence of an explicit surface current density. And that current density, as I said, may either be produced by the free electrons of either of the materials or it can be imposed there, like a current that flows through a wire, for example. You could, you you could have a wire just in between the interface. All right? Okay, now with this in mind, I would like to solve a simple problem and then um, I will give you a simple um, also problem to participate with tap hat, but it's going to be, uh, um, you're going to get points for participation. I want you to think about the problem. I'm not necessarily so interested in solving it. Okay, I just want you to think about that. So let us um, do one problem, knowing all of this, and then we'll do more problems next time on Wednesday. Um, assume that you have an infinite long coil that um, it's nothing else but I will do two things. I will show it on a side view and then on a cross section. So you have a coil that goes like this. Very close though. The loops are very close to each other. And goes forever. Let's assume that this has a very long length. And then um, let's assume that this goes like that. So from here, it will go like this. And if I make this cut, if I make a cut like that here, it's going to look like this. Okay. Then um, what I will do is to change it into a different form. We'll come back to this as a matter of fact. But let's assume that what I do here is the following. I change, I consider still a coil like this, but not with a round cross section, but it looks more like a uh, um, Okay, I elongate the two sides, so it looks more like that here. In fact, the other way, I'm sorry, it would be like this. This one, the length, that should be the length. 
and um, the other two sides become very, I was right, so oh, I'm trying to show it better. So let's assume that I n legate it, so the, um, like this, so practically it changes into two Okay, my gra gra drawing skills are limited. Yeah. Let's assume that we, this um, circular changes to something like this, all right? And, and then when we take, so if this was a cross section like that, here it's gonna look more like this. And the current, therefore, will flow like that. But the two sides will be far away, this side and that side. So we have, it's similar to a parallel plate, practically. But you have to connect um, the two sides so that there is, the, there is flow of current. Otherwise, the current cannot stop. That's why we had to do that. There should be a connection of the current, so it goes like this, and then goes back, all right? And these are narrow, so we are looking at a cross-section like this here, and that's what we see. All right, let's try to solve this problem and find out what kind of a field is there that is generated. So let's assume that we have x, um, x, y, and then z. So we have js current here, which is really nothing else. I mean, if there are all of these are so close to each other, and they are n of them, n, but many of them so like that, the, the uh, density of the current that comes out like that will be really n i over that length, okay? Because they are all close to each other from here, there. And then I, then I can create this current density. All right, then, um, what are the boundary conditions that we have here? Here, of course, there is a current that flows along the JS here, is along the Z direction. And here is a minus JS, right, that flows, this opposite current flows along the negative Z direction. In here, we are gonna have a magnetic field. The magnetic field B that is generated by this return will be, well, it's gonna come, the relationship practically is N <coughs> cross H from the boundary conditions between R in this particular case for a moment, we can consider that, and then perfect conductor Ah, in this case, we had nothing outside, so I don't consider perfect conductor. We just have these um, wires, so that they are sitting by themselves around the filter. So in this case, we are going to have N cross H will be JS and N, in this case, is going to be here. And we'll talk about what happens to the outside. Maybe in the beginning to make it simpler, let's assume that um, which are, we are gonna prove it. But I wanted to, to tell you that outside the, the electric, the magnetic field here and there is gonna be much smaller than this one, so practically zero. But we are gonna prove this. For now, I have to give it to you. So in this case, if we assume that B here is zero, or very small. So practically, um, we have this boundary condition where JS is nothing else but this field, uh, uh, this current, NI 
divided by L Z. Okay, well, how much is that? This is minus X. So minus X or AX, let me just be consistent, AX here, AZ, AZ, minus AX cross H equals N, I, L, A, Z. For A, X cross something to give A, Z, you need to have H to be along the negative A, Y. And it's going to be equal to N, I, L. All right? And therefore, B, so the, the um, magnetic field goes like this. And therefore, B will be mu naught N I L N along the negative Y direction, the way I have it on the board. So practically, what we find from this case is like it happened in a parallel plate capacitor, all right, we, where we had charges plus Q and minus Q, and the electric field was constant in there, did not depend on X or whatever parameter, all right? It was constant, had the, the direction from one plate to another. In the case of current flowing, um, to conductors, for example, we assume that the outside easily equals zero. When currents are flowing on the surface, and those currents are uniform, in this case, they are just uh, parts of, a, of uh, coils, you know, they're th flowing through coils. And then we have n number of them with a uh, current um, flowing I over a length L, then practically we find that that generates a magnetic field B that is parallel to this and independent of any of the X, Y, Z parameters. So it's a very similar, you see, uh, it, it, that's why I say there is enough, uh, there is a lot of duality between electrostatics and magnetostatics when you replace charges with currents and electric with magnetic fields. And of course, you are careful in how you um, change the other electric parameters, all right? With this, then, any questions? Yes. This is coming out. So this is positive Z. Okay? Positive Z. Um, N is going this direction. It's negative X. So for N cross H to give a positive Z, that needed to be along the negative Y direction. All right. So let's uh, now look at this problem that I selected. Okay, so um, I have already assigned that practically. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I went to a different one. This one, I have not assigned this, but I will assign it right now. Assign it, and then I will also present it to you. Oh, I cannot present it without an assignment, so I will show you if you can see it from here. All right, so now we have this one metallic conductor that carries a uniform current, as it shows there. And then it talks about um, the magnetic field at point P inside along the axis and Q outside. And then it asks us to find out oh, 
whether it is the field at point P much bigger, much smaller, or about the same. And I would like to give you a few minutes, five minutes to do that and then talk about it. What is it we decided? Why we, why we selected the um, particular answer? Yes. So for the point A, A is the harmless object of the statistics. Well, let me see. One second. Let me get my. So point P. No, point P is inside. You see the axis? There is an axis of the loop. You see the axis? It's on the axis. OK. It's inside, of course, the axis goes. What's that? Oh, no, sorry. Has everybody responded? Huh? Uh, not yet, OK. Right. 
Ready? Five minutes. Okay. Um, 30 seconds for those who have not done this yet, have not entered your answers. Is anybody? Okay, ready. I don't hear anybody objecting. Okay, so you have most of the most of you have selected A. Ah, here. And so why is A you think? Some of you very few have selected B and one has selected C. But um, let's see why is A, those of you, who most of you believe is A. Who is going to explain to me why? Why did we put A? What group wants to? Yes. Do you think that inside is going to be constant? Okay, why is that? And outside, therefore, is going to be what? There, there probably is going to be either very, very small or zero. Zero in case that conductor is thick enough, most conductors are. Um, because in statics, the field comes right at the surface of the conductor. Now, in higher frequencies, you may have field penetrating, but we don't have this problem. I mean, current penetrating, we don't have this problem here, so it's on the surface. So, you will not see anything on the outside. It's going to cancel out. Or if it doesn't, if somehow that has not been grounded well enough, all right, and still there is something floating, flowing outside, it's going to cancel enough to be so small that practically we will consider it to be zero. All right, so that is correct. And then what was the trick here that made you believe that it is constant? What was the one critical parameter in this problem that allowed you correctly as you did to go to a problem like this? The length. The length was so long compared to the radius that it looked like it was infinite, okay? All right, very good. So um, we'll, I will give you on Wednesday a group of problems so you can read for the midterm, which is the following week. Yes, of course. Yeah, and the problem solving tomorrow, always, every Tuesday. Ah, it's going to be uh, this coming, uh, thank you for reminding me, it's going to be this coming weekend. Sunday or Saturday. Well, uh, it's going to be on Sunday. Yeah, I will tell you Sai, on Wednesday. All right, thank you. Yeah, I'm fine today. It's going to average 37. That's excellent. Yeah, Good for you. I'm How are you doing? I'm like, I think passing, but I don't Okay. Know. Okay, you will. Yeah. yeah. And, but today's lecture is fine, though. Like, fine. Like, I try like, to read it, but like, every single lecture. So, like, so Yes, a lot of new, it's a new, but yeah. we, that's why we are revisiting yeah. every like summary. Us, like, yes, so we'll do this every time because mm -hmm. the more you hear about it, right. the better off, all mm -hmm. right? That's why we do this yeah. early. I'm really looking forward to tomorrow's session. Okay, session okay. Applied. Yeah, perfect. Okay, <laughs> good. Yeah. Yes, Sunday, Sunday. You will push it Sunday? Yes. And it will be the Wednesday before the session? Mm, the makeup assignments will be due the same day. 
the same word yes. online? Yes. Okay. It's like a take home, same so day. So you'll post it in five like you regularly do homework? No, no, I will post it around uh, noon, and then it's going to be, I will give you three hours for whatever I will give you. Okay. It's going to be done for three. It's going to be available. I, you will see. I will ex 